Neptune of the V Brown Bag U.S. podcast. Uh, we are kicking off our DevOps series tonight with uh, with Mr. John Willis, um, one of the one of the great minds in the DevOps community. Um, some quick notes before we dive in: uh, the Brown Bag Tech Talks are going to be at the OpenStack Paris Summit in two weeks. Um, if you're going or and want to present, or if you're just going in and want to watch. Uh, watch that URL, uh, openstack.provitovn.com for schedule and so forth. Um, if you're going to VMworld EMEA, we're going to be there as well. Uh, go ahead and sign up for a quick talk. Um, like we, we really want you to come out and talk. Uh, I, I don't know when EMEA is. Is that another like two weeks out as well? Be a week out, two weeks? Doesn't really matter. It will be there. Um, uh, if you want to get involved in the conversation, uh, those are our various Twitter handles. And then if you just want to uh, drop us a line on the V Brown Bag hashtag, we're going to monitor that during the show tonight, as well as uh, ongoing throughout the weeks, throughout the uh, throughout the months, throughout the years after the fact to uh, answer any and all questions that you have. Um, other shows we've got going is uh, APAC, EMEA, Latin America, and of course US. Uh, dates and times on the slide there. It, it's gotten to be way too big a mouthful to try to run them all off all at once. Um, tonight, again, John Willis is on. And then uh, actually co-hosting with me, I have Matt Brender as well. Hey. Um, and then a quick overview of the rest of our series. Uh, Jonas Rosland, or Virtual Swede, is going to be on again next week. Uh, I believe that's a vagrant refresher. And then Matt, uh, Matt Brender, you're actually presenting two weeks out, I believe, on GitHub. That's correct. And then Trevor, you're also on the line. If you want to, what are you presenting on? Three weeks out? Three weeks out? I'll be presenting on Puppet. Okay, that is outstanding. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to go ahead and just kind of hand hand the show over to Mr. John Willis. Make presenter there it is. Hooray buttons. Fun side note while we transition, I'm getting a lot of favorites and retweets from DevOps All the Things by a bunch of company startups and names I've never heard of. So I think John's going to tell us why that's so popular on the internet. <laughs> DevOps? What's DevOps? You got the wrong guy. Hey. No. Uh, hey, thanks, guys. Um, so, um, yes, my name is John Willis. I uh, also use this incredibly complex name called Botch Gloop on Twitter. Um, but it is pretty much the way that um, if you're interested in anything I have to say, um, how to communicate with me because it's pretty much my portal to life these days. Um, but I, I've recently uh, changed jobs for people who don't know me. That doesn't make a difference. But I'm currently called an executive in residency for an investment bank, which only means that the world has tilted off its access because there should be no universe where a title of my job description should have the word executive in it. So, But be that as it may, this is a presentation about DevOps. So, um, so I, I, you know, when I, I thank you guys. Thank you, Cody. Thank you guys for inviting me um, into this series. I'm really excited. I got to meet you guys, a lot of you guys at the VMworld, and, and their, uh, your kind of uh, brown bag thing was awesome there. And uh, So when you, you asked me to go back, I had to go actually dig deep. I haven't really done a DevOps. What is a DevOps in a while? You know, you, you tend to kind of get down the road and, and you start talking about all these exotic things about that are happening or these weird edge case stuff. And So I had to kind of go back and try to dust off and then update it with a lot of um, a lot of kind of new things that have happened. So in general, what I, I'm about to cover in the next, you know, 50 minutes, whatever it takes. I'm going to give you a little introduction. Um, I wrote an article um, probably about three or four years ago. It was actually when I worked for Ops Co No, actually before that. Right. So um, I wrote this article called DevOps Convergence, and I tried to describe how we got to this thing called DevOps, you know, and it was truly a convergence. So I'll cover that. Then I'll talk about um, kind of patterns. You know, what are these? What are some things that, like, you know, we see, you know, if we want to call some particular company an interesting way of operating that might fit the uh, kind of, we could call it DevOps, you know, and, and what does a company like that look like? And then, and then last but not least, um, um, in 2013, I did a lot of presentations on this uh, culture as a strategic weapon or culture as a weapon. So I'll, I'll kind of end up with a little bit of that um, to... Uh, you know, and, and it kind of plays back into, you know, what really DevOps 
is and um, and and how um, how you know um, executed effectively really can be a differentiator, and it is for certain companies. So that's that's pretty much the agenda. Um, so um, I, I stole some of these slides from Gene Kim. Gene Kim's a good buddy of mine, and we're we're, we're, we're kind of co-developed the IT revolution. If you don't know Gene, he wrote the Phoenix Project, founder of Tripwire. Um, just an important uh, person in the DevOps story, but actually important in just operations in general. He obviously the founder of Tripwire. He also was uh, wrote the book called Visible Ops. If anybody's, uh, most of us think that's the Bible for for operations. Um, and more recently, he's written a novel called The Phoenix Project. Uh, we're working on a, um, a conference that's really interesting. It's called the uh, DevOps Enterprise Conference. It's dev DevOpsEnterprise.io. And you know, one of the things that Jim has identified um, is, you know, if you start looking at all the companies that are actually doing DevOps, it's 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 pretty good. I mean, we look at web scale. That's easy. You know, Amazon, Netflix, Etsy, um, Spotify, Twitter. Um, but all right, but then some of the bigger software companies. Okay, like that's okay too. Like we expect like that our our software company should be kind of implementing DevOps. But where it gets even more interesting, and this is what you're going to see if people at Pay attention to this DevOps Enterprise Conference we're running. Um, it's uh, basically in, in October. We're, we're going to basically publish all the videos. So even if you can't make it, all the videos will be online. You're going to see companies like GE Capital, Nationwide, Mellon Bank, um, some really big, you know, the Gap, Nordstrom, so Barclays, which isn't on this list, um, Macy's. So retail, you know, banking, uh, financial institutions. So the question always comes up can enterprise do DevOps? And I think. The answer to me has always been yes, and but I think after that conference, when you see the videos of companies like you know Nordstrom's, Macy's, Disney, Barclays, PNC, um, some of the largest financial institutions, they're all doing it. General Motors, uh, everybody's doing it. <laughs> so uh, and you know the U.S. government, there, there's a at the O'Reilly conference recently, Velocity, uh, the U.S. government talked about this digital services group that has basically. Um, um, direct line support from the White House to get things done. This was kind of a, a post, um, you know, a, a post, you know, healthcare um, debacle, if you will, or the the online uh, healthcare thing. So, um, so again, it's a big story. A uh, couple more things. I will get into what DevOps is in a little bit, but I wanted to kind of paint a picture of what's going on. Um, so, Puppet Labs. Um, I, I know you've got a series on Puppet coming down the road, and so uh, that would be really interesting. Uh, Puppet Labs for the last two years has sponsored this um, State of DevOps survey. So two years ago, it was about 4,000 people. Um, I mean, it is sort of an echo chamber. I mean, you got to go through um, you go through the the, the uh, Puppet website um, to get there. Um, and and the first the, the 2013 survey was was interesting. Um, but last year, um, the, the up there, and Gene Kim is actually part of this. Jez Humble, Gene Kim, and and Puppet Labs. The, last year was almost ten thousand people responded. Um, they actually brought in um, a, a PhD statistics university a professor, and um, and they're really starting. The data is actually getting a lot more interesting. Um, and what they're they've been able to identify these kind of high performing DevOps teams that you know that they tend to be thirty times more frequent deployments. Um, they're 8,000 times faster lead time than their peers. Um, and they're more reliable. So they're one of the arguments that people make, oh, I can't do these kind of, I can't be this fast because it might break things, right? And, and what they're showing across the board from large enterprise to web scale that like their data is proving out that that's absolutely not true. The faster they do, the higher success rates they're getting on reliability. Um, you know, one of the things that's really interesting as well, we, you know, for these old timers, you've had the mean time between failure, those kind of models of, you know, how do I predict or stop failure? You know, in DevOps, we, we tend to start thinking about not so much how you prevent failure, but how good you are when failure happens. Because that becomes, in a, in a complex world, like, you know, systems are getting so complex, you know, that, that like, at some point, uh, stopping failure actually like it becomes kind of, um, I, I dare I say, impossible. And then what what really matters now is how quick do you get out of failure mode? And so there's this kind of embracing of the mean time to repair and measuring how good you are at when things break. Um, so uh, these um, 
these companies are, you know, have responded and been measured with this idea that they're 12 times faster at repair mode. Um, since I've got an hour, I can tell great stories. Normally, I only, normally I, I'm actually speaking in interrupt today. I only got 30 minutes, right? But so this MTTR is an interesting story here, right? To, um, there's a company. I, I would normally say how many people heard Night Capital, but you know, I'll just assume that 10% uh, of listeners have heard of this. Um, so there's this company called Night Capital. It was a couple of years ago. Um, they basically were uh, high frequency trading. Uh, sometimes referred to as black box trading, they, they they put their servers on an exchange and they do um, Algor trading, they you know uh, latency arbitrage, all this really cool stuff. But the thing was that um, this company accidentally put a change in that was basically supposedly would turned on a test system that would test and make dummy trades. And when you do dummy trades in a high frequency trading that is basically an algorithmic trading, things can go haywire. So they actually put a production change in that, that basically started doing test trades in production in a high frequency environment. In three hours they lost like four hundred million dollars. In twenty four hours they were out of business. Right? And and so there's some great write ups from people who've kind of looked at the SEC filing of this and all that. In the end, you know, my contention is that they absolutely just were not good at MTTR. Because I've talked to friends of mine in other high frequency trading organizations and said, hey, the, you know, could this happen? The answer is absolutely. You know, we've had scenarios similar to this before. What would have happened had it happened in your um, you know, kind of high HFT um, system or, or, or business? And it's like, put it this way, we would have caught it, you know, no later than 15 minutes. You know, so how good are you at repair is the difference. You can, again, predict and try to stop failure forever. Um, but if, if your repair is like two minutes versus three hours, you know, you might be the difference between a blip on the radar versus going out of business. Um, some other kind of interesting things in this DevOps State of Union survey. Again, if you go to Puppet Labs, if you Google State of, um, State of DevOps uh, 2014, you know, organizations with high performance, organizations with 2.5 uh, likely to exceed profitability. Now, so here's an interesting thing. They actually allowed some or gave the, some of the companies, public companies, the ability to opt in to say who, what their, you know, their um, publicly traded company name was. And they were able to do some correlation. Now, it was a smaller subset of the 10,000. So, again, the data is much smaller. But what this, this to me is the most interesting thing. I've been doing this DevOps thing for about, you know, I would roughly let's say eight years. The term was coined five years ago, um, but but like like this is like data that like I can really sink my teeth into when I'm able to start showing companies like uh, I'm not saying that Target is one of these companies, but Target has done presentations where they've said you know we actually are being able to show revenue differences in the way we're operating, right? So these are some metrics that came out of a smaller subset of that DevOps survey. Um, you know, my shameless plug as podcasts go, um, I've done this series now for five years with my, one of my best friends, Damon Edwards. Uh, we do this DevOps Cafe podcast. Um, we've interviewed just about everybody that, you know, you know, the founders of Puppet, the founders of Chef, the founders of Ansible. The, I mean, just go down the list of different people that we've brought in and, and interviewed over the last five years. And so there's a great, like, we have a lot of people tell us when they go back and they listen to the shows and it's kind of their you know, university of learning DevOps. So, um, so there's a lot there and a lot of stuff I'm going to cover here. So I just wanted to do that. I talked about Gene Kim. I think, uh, you know, Gene's a good friend of mine. I don't make any money on the book to the left. I might actually make some pennies on the book on the right, but, but, but right now the book on the left has been out for two years. It's called the Phoenix project. It's a novel. And if you want to call it, I, I think I would call it a novel about a DevOps story. And so I, if you haven't read this book, I definitely recommend reading. You will love the book because you will start reading and say, oh, I know that guy. I work with him. Oh, that guy. <laughs> you know, you'll actually start, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the, uh, everybody kind of chuckles about when they read it. It's like, did Gene sneak into my organization and like turn on a tape recorder or something? Um, read the book. And then I would say that if you agree with it and you like that story and you're trying to set trying to make change in your organization, buy a copy and give it to your boss. 
right, and, and, and force your boss to read it, right, and so uh, again, it's called The Phoenix Project, it, it really has become the poster child as a book goes, it is a novel, um, if there's any old timers out there that have ever heard of Elliot Gorak, the book called The Goal, it's actually a modern day rewrite of The Goal, um, so that's kind of cool. On the right hand side, I'm basically co-authoring with a group of gentlemen, including Gene, um, basically what we're trying to describe as the prescriptive um, solution to the story in the Phoenix Project, which is should be out by the end of the year. I mean, it's about five or six of us. So um, anyway, so so and 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 if you want to go to the IT Revolution Press, it's a, a fair amount of blog articles. I've written about four or five blog articles. In fact, the convergence of DevOps story is actually on that on that site. Gene has written a lot of really cool sites. One of the things I, I said earlier that one of the things I uh, when I when when the guys asked me if I would do this, I went back and I looked at some of my old presentations and uh, and I, I you know one of the things that early on I wanted to do when I like people ask me, well, John, what is DevOps? And I thought, you know, who are the people that I most admire, you know, and what do they say, you know, typically? So Ben Rockward, he's over at Joint. Um, if you want to see an amazing, in, in, in fact, the best, the, the best, the best video presentation on DevOps um, to date, in my opinion, is one called um, "The DevOps Transformation" by Ben Rockwood. Google it; um, it, it it's incredible. You know, Ben says DevOps is a banner for change. Um, Adam Jacob, the founder of uh, Chef Ops Code, um, he says it's a cultural and professional movement. To date, most people would say, you know, if you if you force me to give you a one sentence answer of DevOps, and most people I know would say, yep, that's the one I'm going to give. DevOps is a cultural professional movement. John Ospar works over at Etsy. We'll talk about Etsy a little bit. Uh, John has an interesting, um, you know, story in this DevOps story. Uh, John actually worked at Flickr, you know, back in the day. Um, he he did this presentation at Velocity. I think it was 2000 and Nine or maybe it was 2008, where he described this um, presentation where he he said that at Flickr they did ten ploy ten deploys a day to, in production at Flickr, and it kind of freaked everybody out, right? But now it's created a whole movement of of continuous delivery. You know, people that, and we'll talk more about these kind of practices in a little bit. But you can read John says you know DevOps is what some people are calling the renewed cross interest in development and operation collaboration. Uh, my good friend Damon Edwards you know, tends to be more word, wordy than other people, you know, uh, you know, looking ways to break down silos. For me, you know, this is the same thing I used to say in the early days of cloud, like, let everybody else describe what cloud is, um, you know, I know one when I see one, you know, and so I, you know, it's kind of the same thing for DevOps, you know, when I see a company operating with certain principles and patterns, like, okay, you're DevOps in my opinion. <laughs> not, it, not that there is a kind of a judgment or a check mark for the thing, but but you do tend to see these companies that operate a certain way. So how do we get here, right? So like again, I don't you know if people try to tell you DevOps is A or DevOps is B, you know, they're just as foolish as the people in the early days that said cloud is A or cloud is B, right? The more important story, um, you know, I mean again I go back, I mean, if you really want to pin it, I take one of these people that I really trust their opinion on and use that as their definition. But the more important story is how did we get to this thing we call DevOps, right? And there, there's there's multiple vectors into this, right? Um, certainly, open source is an important part of this, right? But, you know, the you know not only open source operating systems, but open source middleware. You know, you think about the evolution of open source over the last 10 or 15 years, and how we've had to deal with these Linux, particularly Linux environments, that had to um, adapt and 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 use more software in the way we do things. So open source is, you know, is an important part of this story. Um, configuration management um, is an important thread here, right? So, um, you know, 20 years ago, a gentleman called Mark Burgess created something called CF Engine. Um, it was really more of an academic project. Mark inherited. He was a computer. He's actually a physicist that became a computer scientist or a, a professor of computer science at University of Oslo. And somebody said, oh, by the way, since you're the head of the computer science department, you need to manage the data center as well. And he looked at the app, the tools at the time and thought, this is insane. And so he got his student and they did a, basically kind of a scientific study on how to do it right. And they came up with uh, principles of things like convergence, item potency, 
um, and ultimately created a, a project called CF Engine. The problem was back in the day, they had really no intent to make it usable for consumability. Luke Kinise, the founder of Puppet Labs, was pretty much a power user of CF Engine, and but was very frustrated by the fact that it wasn't usable. So Luke, basically a scientist himself, he was actually a chemical engineer, or you know. Sorry, Luke, if I get this wrong, but you, something in chemistry. But he basically was frustrated, and he basically kind of rewrote using all the same principles that Mark had created in CF Engine, but created, wrote it in Ruby, created his own usable DSL, and then went around the world trying to preach it to you know thousands and tens of thousands, and today who knows how many number of people to make this an extremely popular product. So if you want to look at a person who should kind of have a poster in the DevOps story, Luke Kinnis is clearly one of them. Even though Mark invented the genre, Luke spent a lot of pavement time or air travel time going around the world getting you know, companies like Facebook to use it and, and you know, internally use it, some of the largest web scale infrastructures. Um, and then you know, a good friend of mine, Adam Jacob, who is the founder of Ops Code Chef, I had the opportunity to go to work for him. I was a ninth employee. He was just like Luke, but he was a frustrated puppet user. Felt there some with some usability and cloud opportunities that weren't being met by Puppet Labs, and it wasn't Puppet Labs at the time. It was called Reductive Labs. But and he went ahead and wrote his own version of a configuration management based on Puppet, inherited with the same principles from Mark. So, so again, configuration management is a, is a really important thread. And, and it's not the only thread. Some people think that DevOps is just configuration management. Hey, that, we're good. And that's not it. And then um, last and not least, and, and kind of important drivers, is um, this continuous delivery flow. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on continuous delivery. I do have some slides later where I'll kind of talk about the importance of the flow model. But there's, um, you know, if you really want the Bible on continuous delivery, Jez Hummel, good buddy of mine, that book on the right, Continuous Delivery, um, it will tell you everything you want to know about continuous delivery. It is considered pretty much the, the standard manual, operating manual for how to do continuous delivery. Um, the reason I have the book on the left is a book called Web Operations that had it come out six months later, it probably would have been called DevOps book. Um, but it, it is a um, multi-author chapter book by some of the people I've mentioned, John Osbar and a bunch of others. Adam Jacob, the founder of Chef, wrote uh, an article about infrastructure as code. Um, I, I, I really think if you want to get the mindset of what it was like in 2009, 2010, how people were thinking about this new idea of this DevOps thing or about to become DevOps, that book is an excellent book. And it's not outdated. Some books I say, you know, don't even bother buying that book because everything has changed. But the concept there is, are still like spot on as, as we sit there. So again, one of the things you're going to find, and people hate me, either love me or hate me, but usually hate me because they complain that they, every time I present or they talk to me, I have increased their reading list. So, so there's going to be a lot of books recommended in this presentation. Hopefully everybody's having fun at this point. Um, if not, well, I don't know what to say. Moving on, so um, you know, I think there's a, a lot of stuff to be talked about here. Another really important thing in the kind of convergence of DevOps, you know, I talked about open source and configuration management, and you know, continuous delivery. Um, in parallel of that, there's you know, if we go really far back, you know, um, we don't have to go too far back, but we, in America, there's this concept of lean, right, where manufacturing picked up some of the influences of what was going on in Japan for manufacturing and we, 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 we basically you know the General Motors, the Ford back in probably the 70s or well probably early 80s um, picked up this idea there was a book called The Machine That Changed the World uh, James Walmack was kind of the introduction of changing the way we did manufacturing because we were getting our butts kicked by the Japanese car manufacturers basically that thread became really almost a direct line to DevOps. And, and, and it came through, you know, some, you know, kind of stepping stones, you know, including uh, the Papendix um, implementing lean software. So lean manufacturing now turned into lean software. Um, you have web scale picking up on agile development models, again, coming heavily out of the lean model. And, and just uh, for those of you who are 
um, either incredibly bored right now or incredibly interested. I'll do your quick, you know, rundown of that kind of lean thread. Um, there's a very important company out of uh, at Japan called Toyota Products and Systems. Most people with engineering degrees have kind of understand the significance of what they did. I will tell you that if you really want to understand some of the important influences of things we do today at companies that we call poster childs for DevOps, they come almost directly from a place that happened in Toyota Products and System, a gentleman called Toyota Ono. In America, it became lean manufacturing. Um, uh, Stephen Bell, um, uh, Mike Orzin um, created some books that kind of translated um, the lean concept into IT and enterprise. And then a gentleman called Eric Reese created a book uh, in 2011 called Lean Startup. Um, the Agile thread is also part of the convergence part. I mean, you have all the Agile activities are going on in development. So what was happening is there was this kind of build up, right? You had Scrum in 1995, the Agile Manifesto in 2001, Lean Software Development by the pop of this. You had Kanban invented in 2008, which is another interesting Agile tool. Um, and all this was like pent up. And so what happened actually in 2008, a gentleman named um, Patrick Dubois, um, who's another really important figure in this story, and a good friend of mine, Andrew Schaefer, who actually was one of the uh, founder, co-founders of Puppet Labs, went at an Agile conference, and Patrick was asking around, is anybody thinking about the operation side of this Agile thing? Because you know, the way he was looking at it is, you got all this speed and agility on the development, and you're pushing that off to an operations group, and you know, in, in agile terms, they were still doing waterfall. Like the operations was not agile. So like here's this fast, here it is, and, and the operations people would be like, well, um, I can do that in November. No, no, can't do it in November. Got to do it in December. Oh, that one? Yeah, that's going to be February. Right? And like a complete breakdown in the flow, right? And so Patrick was like, like the, surely in 2008 somebody has to be discussing this breakdown in flow. And so they, actually he scheduled a boff at the Agile Conference 2008 and nobody showed up. So, but the thing was, um, he, I'll talk about this, like he actually decided to, um, he was he's based out of Belgium and he was so frustrated that he um, went back and he just said, I'm gonna just create my own conference. And I'll actually talk about that conference in a minute. It was called DevOps Days, but um, I'll just leave that as a placeholder. But it, um, the frustration of doing that boff and not being able to find anybody at an Agile conference that was even willing or wanting to talk about like the other side of the fence that was basically equally as important in this flow story. Um, if you haven't read, I'm, I'm not going to go too much in Eric Ries' Lean Startup. Uh, while all this was happening, Eric Ries was doing some really interesting stuff with a startup. Um, uh, and, and he basically wrote a blog called Lessons Learned where he basically every day pretty much blogged about it, what he was doing, ultimately turned into a book. Now he gets like $50,000 to talk in front of people. You know, God bless him. Um, but he, it would, you know, even though like most people would say, well, Eric Reese, DevOps, I don't get that. But one of the things about Eric Reese was he was doing this startup, and after he did startup, he actually became an advisor for a lot of startups in Silicon Valley that became the early implementations of DevOps. And, and it's very simple things, and it comes a lot from Lean, like this concept of a minimal viable product. You know, instead of spending six months or a year developing something that you think your customers might like, how about I just put like a little thing first in front of a customer and see if they like it and do some testing. And if they don't like it, maybe I'll do a pivot. You know, maybe I'm gonna sell, you know, I'm, I'm gonna sell root beer but I find out that everybody that I tried to put the root beer in really wants, you know, a cherry cola. I mean, it's stupid examples, but the point is, like, I, I got to be flexible and agile enough to do the pivot. Um, he also was doing continuous delivery real early on. In fact, that web operations book I said earlier, he's got a whole chapter explaining why it's probably the single best chapter. I mean, you can buy that continuous delivery book by uh, by Jez Humble, right? So back here. The book on the right, like this is a, the, the one on the right is a very thick book. It's going to take you a long time to read. If you just want to understand the rationale behind continuous delivery, get the web operations book and there's probably, it's probably a 10 or 15 page chapter by Eric Reese 
that explains the rationale and why continuous delivery works. So there. Um, you know, and then there's some other things that he talks about, like he, he explains the, the lean concept of five whys, split testing, all that. Again, I, I think this is, a, right now a lot of universities use this uh, as their kind of entrepreneurial one-on-one -on -one courses. Um, another, you know, I said the Toyota production systems was, um, was an important part of the story, driving what became lean in the U.S. One of the things uh, Toyota had done real early is they had this concept of what they call the Andon cord. And if you look on the top of the, that pretty young woman's hair, uh, blonde hair, right on top there's like that kind of rope thing there. So basically what that was, was in an assembly line, anybody could pull that, anybody, and anybody was, they were encouraged, they were authorized to actually stop the whole line if they saw a defect. Like, you know, if, if, the, if the car's going down and it's like, oh my God, it's going to get past me and I can't get this or this is broken, you know, it was... Everybody Toyota understood that stopping that defect there was so more cost effective than having that defect go somewhere further down the line. And if we see where all the recall stuff now, right, like the cost of a defect once it's in it, owned by, once somebody owns the car, the cost of a defect, as opposed to somebody early in the line, it's a hard pill to swallow. But Toyota was doing this. In fact, General Motors still hasn't figured this out. Apologies to anybody who works with General Motors who might be on the call. They're still struggling with this concept. Um, but here's the thing, they would pull that cord and then there would be this kind of screen sign that would basically identify like where it was, what station it was at, and people would swarm to fix it because that was the most important thing at that point was to fix the problem. So it was important to stop the line, like, oh my God, you just stopped the line, oh, how long is this going to cost us, how much is it going to cost us, but it was important to do that, but it was important to fix it fast, remember the MTTR thing? Um, but here's the thing, right? Some of you who follow or are involved with development organizations, today we call this the break the build you know, thing. Like it, we, there's a lot of tomfoolery around. Somebody breaks the build, they'll throw up a picture with a dunce hat on the guy who broke the build or the woman who broke the build. And, you know, sometimes there'll be a, uh, I've been in sites where they'll set up a Christmas tree and it'll light up when the build breaks, right? Um, the reason I have the Gatlin gun here, I was actually at a shop. Um, about a year and a half ago, where um, where the they they actually had a Nerf Gatling gun hooked up to a Raspberry Pi that when the build broke, it geo positioned to the person who broke it and started firing uh, Nerf pistols on them, right? But this is all part of that feedback loop of you know of, of you know thinking in a different way, like oh stopping a line wouldn't that break it? You know wouldn't that be you know no, you have to stop the line because you don't want a defect to be downstream. And again, there's, there's a lot of great stories about break the build and how people do it and all that good stuff. Um, you know, I talked about, you know, kind of the CF engine puppet chef thread. Uh, Tim O'Reilly, you know, I, I reminded Tim O'Reilly recently on Twitter, you know, that people were talking about DevOps. And, and Tim O'Reilly in 2006 wrote an article called Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. And basically, it's a story where he kind of identified operations as a secret sauce. It was his kind of epiphany. He had just got out of a meeting with a person who ran operations at Microsoft, who where Microsoft was doing all, you know, the, the data centers that did basically all your updates, Microsoft updates. And that was a large cloud infrastructure. And he was like, you know what? This operations stuff is a lot more important, than, or at least equally important, equally as important as the software development stuff that everybody in my organization has been writing books about. It actually prompted the Velocity Conference, um, you know, and then again, you know, just leaving some kind of tick marks for, you know, you know, you had the developers with the, the programmatic program or the Agile Manifesto, those kind of things. So I promised you that I would talk about this gentleman called uh, Patrick Dubois. Most people, including myself, would say that Patrick Dubois is the godfather of DevOps. And again, um, right place, right time, but an incredibly smart guy really awesome dude and actually has kept the guardrails around DevOps um, and because the respect for him um, the, the way he's kind of vanguarded this this movement has been incredible um, again five years ago basically five years ago in October next, uh, five years ago next month he, he got in his frustration and said you know what I'm gonna run a conference 
huh, what should I call it? I got I got this issue between developers and operations. Like, ah, I'll call it DevOps. And he called it DevOps days. I was fortunate enough to go there. I was the only American that was there. Um, I, I, I indirectly found out about this story of a friend of mine talking about agile infrastructure. I'm like, I gotta understand agile infrastructure. He's like, well, there's some dude in Belgium gonna run a conference, so so I, I figured out a way to get there. Um, we're actually having our five year anniversary next month. Well, in fact, this month, right, October first. <laughs> so um, and um, it's gonna be a real celebration. So for those of you that don't know DevOps days, we ran the first one in um, in Gand or Patrick ran that. I actually, me and my friend Damon actually ran the first one in the U.S. the following year, so in, in 2010 um, in Mountain View. It was a huge success. It, uh, for about two years, we did one in, in U.S., one in U.K., and then about two years ago, maybe three years ago, all these regional ones. And so if you go to DevOpsDays.org, you'll see there's probably been 100 over the last five years, and there's one in almost every major city. I mean, New York, Austin. Um, obviously, California, Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, almost every city, Europe, cities in Europe. Um, so there's going to be a DevOps Day in 2015 somewhere in the EU. Um, if any of this interests you that I'm talking about, I, I really highly recommend. They're free. Oh, actually, sometimes they, they charge like 70 or 80 bucks, 90 bucks. It's, um, um, it, it's just to keep the, you know, we, the, free, you wind up getting all uh, registrations that don't show up. So it's kind of a trying to keep people honest that if they register they're probably going to show up. I, you know, again, I, if you want to be involved in this thing, find a DevOps. There's tons of videos out there now too, so you can go out and, uh, you know, um, I mean, most of them are on Vimeo, but if you go out on Vimeo and do DevOps days, you'll see um, a lot of stuff. Again, I'm on Botch Gloop. Like, if you really want to follow up on any of that stuff, honestly, please just ping me there. So I told you I would talk about patterns. Um, you know that you know, I, and I, you know there is really no one answer to what DevOps is, right? So then, so I gave you kind of the convergence story, um, the best I can describe it. Lots of different influences, real, lots of people that help, uh, myself included, Damon, uh, Mark, you know, Mark Burgess, Luke Kniss, Adam Jacob, Gene Kim, right? On and on and on. So the but the patterns become interesting. So uh, Damon and I. About five years ago, or four years ago, we, we coined out of kind of in anger, right? We, we, we just were tired of not being able to describe DevOps in a way, uh, you know, like everything, you, you can't have something where, you, where it can't be described in an acronym. So we were like, in a podcast, we just wanted to kind of come up with a describe it. We didn't really want it to be the, uh, the, the, the taxonomy manifesto for DevOps, but, but it ultimately, it has become, uh, you know, kind of, Nice way to describe. We called it CAMS, Culture Automation Measurement Sharing. Just Humble added the L to it. Um, the only thing that we have proved that we really stink in acronyms. But, you know, what we say is that, you know, DevOps is a social problem. It's a pe like, again, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, awesome tools. Uh, but, but if you don't address the culture, everything is really honestly. But, well, I'll only say two things. I'll say, A, it's a waste of time, but B, like, if it's not a waste of time for you, it's still, it ain't, it ain't DevOps, right? We, we say uh, CAM's not AM. So the culture part, and again, culture's hard. It's behavior. Some of my last couple of slides, I'll talk about companies I think that do it right. I mean, the automation, so the A in CAM's is, like, again, the, the monitoring, the configuration management, like really, really cool tools that are out there. Most of them open source. There are some vendor solutions, but, but you know, I mean, things like Chef Puppet, Ansible, Graphite is an incredible tool being used. Uh, there's all sorts of really cool uh, monitoring solutions, um, uh, complex uh, event processing solutions, you know, in the measurement. And then, you know, we circle back, right, because we have this sharing idea that one of the things you'll find is, is especially at DevOps days, is companies show up and they're not like, well, we can't tell you how we do that. We can't tell you how you do, we do this. They show up and they share. And the sharing is part of the strength that becomes a circle. You know, hey, this is how we do this, how we do culture, this is how we do automation, this is how we do measurement. Um, here's how we do it. And by the way, it's kind of a, a virtual cycle, if you will. You know, and I think I told you the lean structure and why that's important. Okay, this is my single greatest slide. If, if I was told that you know I was going to be the last person 
survivor on the planet, and somehow I had to make sure that a new civilization that flew down and saved everybody, you know, came in and started a new civilization, and I had to have one way, one slide to describe DevOps. As this is horribly gone wrong here, but um, I would use this slide, and I didn't even create the slide. It was actually from my good friend Damon, and he has a blog called Dev Two Ops, the blog. But let me tell you about this slide and why I think it best describes all the things I think are awesome about DevOps. So we talk about this idea of the aha to ka-ching, right? There's that little guy with the light bulb on the left. The aha, I got an idea. Come on, guys, let's go into the war room. Let's get on the whiteboard, right? And then, like, what you expect, hopefully, or most companies would like to have more frequently than not, is that right-hand side where there's some value, customer value, you made money, you're, the, the people you're providing service to are like thumbs up, so they're going to pay you next month or whatever. So, so we go to the aha to ka-ching, the ka-ching being the money. So with people, when, when, this, when the guys like Patrick DeBar and Eric Reese and like different people that created these, you know, these kind of vectors of DevOps, you know, basically, you know, there was this clear, um, you know, kind of metaphor for this problem, which was there was this dev team and there were these ops teams, and there seemed to be see that broken brick thing, what we used to call the wall of confusion. And and so the classic story would be dev would be like, hey, whoever's on the other side of that brick wall, and this is they're gonna send these like Java artifacts over to you. And then you, you picture the dev guy going, I don't know who you are, but oh I got it. Thanks. And then they caught it, and then they put it in, and then the, the dev guy is like, hey, dummy, you didn't put it in the right way. And, and then the, uh, the ops guy is like, or the ops guy or girl is like, what do you mean? You never gave me the right instructions. You're the dummy. Right? And I'm being silly right now. But, but the point was that um, like the, what Patrick wanted to do is destroy that wall. Right? And, and there's all sorts of ways we do that. And then what do we get? We get this flow. And then what, what do we really get? If you look at the top. You know, one of the measurements of agile or of software de uh, so SDLCF software delivery or software development lifecycle is this concept of lead time. You know, how long does it take you from an idea to get something in the hands of a customer? And so DevOps is about shortening that lead time. And how do you coordinate? You, a lot of it is culture, like like breaking out human friction, finding it. And, and I'll tell you, like a lot of discussions over the last five years is, should we call it NetOps Dev or DevOps Sec? Should we include security? Should we call marketing? Mark Dev Sec Dev Ops. And, and I say, you know what? The Devs and Ops is just a metaphor for putting anything under the word Dev or anything under the word Ops and, and figure out how to collaborate and get you know, frictionless flow. And so that's because so there's this kind of left the right flow that like and you know a manifestation of that is continuous delivery. Um, if you read Gene Kim's book, you'll hear a great novel about this. And then on the bottom, remember the and on chord? It's about how do we basically create feedback loops? So we got a right to left flow, and we got a left to right. Um, so what did I say? Uh, I'm sorry. Left to right flow from a lead time shortened. We got a right to left um, circle on feedback and amplifying feedback and trying to catch things earlier in the flow, right? And, and really, in the end, that's an implementation of DevOps in my mind. So how do we get there from a cultural perspective? You know, you know, it, it, easier said than done. But if you remember my when I was listing the different people, the people. People, um, you know, Ben Rockwood said DevOps is this. John Ospar said this, and mine was, "I know one when I see one." Right? When I see one, when I see a company where there clearly is a no rock star mentality, um, that clearly there are shared contributions. Um, they have a healthy attitude toward failure. In fact, um, if you start reading some blogs by John Ospar and what they do at Etsy. Um, they 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 think about failure in a completely different way than classic enterprise or classic IT people. They like failure. They embrace failure. In fact, Netflix has this thing called Chaos Monkey. It's designed to create chaos 
because they believe that when they're able to adapt in chaos modes, they are actually stronger. This gentleman called Nassim Taleb who wrote a book called Anti-Fragile that explains this concept. That there, you know, that um, as systems get more complex, um, it is about resiliency, not resistance. So you'll see a lot of discussion um, on in the DevOps dialogue about embracing failure, thinking about failure as opportunities. And if you're if, if you're not Thinking about it, and it goes back to that MTTR mode. Um, the, the the other thing that's really interesting about the way DevOps people think is that it, there's this kind of it, it's a it's a different way to think about the human machine interaction. And I'm getting very theoretical here, but it it's important to understand this that we we start thinking in terms of like so a classic implementation of what I would call a pattern of a company that I think, oh my god, they're pretty much awesome from a DevOps perspective, is that you'll hear them talk about what's called a blameless postmortem. And there's tons of literature out there about this. And a good friend of mine, Dave Zubrak, is actually writing a book for O'Reilly that should be out by the end of the year on this concept of blameless postmortems. The idea of blameless postmortem is exactly what it is. You know, we do a postmortem, like something went wrong. But we are not we we realize that the human factor is you know in a complex system, even if the human made a mistake, chances are the mistake was made because the human wasn't trained, or there was some political influence. That we, I mean, there's so many different variants that we kind of eliminate the whole blame thing and try to get to the root cause. And that uh, Eric Ries talks about the five whys in his book. You know, um, you know, and and then so again, there's kind of no blame, no victims, shared blame, five whys. And then there's, you know, again, a good focus on metrics, collecting data, um, you know, alignment, goals, um, you know, so um, some, you know, the idea of there's certain authors, good, great, famous, you know, authors that I love, uh, Edward Deming, he would describe something as the aim, the arrow, where's the business goal, and Elliot Gorat would say it's the goal. There's another interesting, um, which I, I think I have all these books listed in the end, uh, Simon Sinek uh, has a... Um, a book called Start With Why. Some uh, some uh, kind of patterns in in, in development. Uh, you know, basically, um, you know, uh, infrastructure is code, configuration is code. Everything is version controlled. Uh, it's a lot about developers taking full end-to-end -end responsibility of their code. Not only they write the code, they write the test-driven development for their code. They write behavior-driven in code. In a place like Netflix. The developers were pagers, so they own it, like forever. This is this idea, like, hey, we're done here. You know, you guys take it, put it in production, and we're going on something else. No, and this is the way Amazon works. A lot of these companies is that, like, the co until you basically deprovision the service, development owns it. So it's a full life cycle development. We test it, we debug it, we continually improve it, and at some point we might decommission the project or the service. And at what point then it's over? But until then, we own it. We own it. You know, we get paged in the middle of the night. Um, you know, so um, so this that kind of done means, um, you know, basically when it's basically, you know, you know, it's in it, it is in production. And in truth, it's actually never done. Frequent releases. Um, another thing you'll see a lot of discussion about from a development perspective is this idea. A lot of this is talked in uh, Jess Humble's book, the continuous delivery book, about. Um, Instrumenting uh, feature flags, um, something called canary releases, like kind of rolling releases. You know, the canary in the coal mine, like basically figure out ways to implement things so that you can incrementally test, right? You know, so you might put out a feature that hits, um, you know, all of uh, New York. And if that goes well, then move it to the East Coast. If that goes well, you know, all of the United States. If that goes well, Canada, Canada, the U.S. and, and South America. In operations, uh, we instrument pervasively. We basically want to collect data. We want to really hold on trends. Um, you know, um, we uh, automate wherever possible. Um, we, 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 we implement, if anything fails, the kind of and on cord. Uh, enable graceful degradation. Although you'll see a lot of this in um, in software, in the development as well, like this, there's a really interesting, Netflix has some great articles about what they call the circuit breaker patterns or uh, bulkheads, and this is the idea like, instead of something breaking and everything breaks, they actually design around the idea of um, 
the circuit breaker, just like your home, right? Like instead of all electricity going out because of some glitch or some over over power, right? We just click off this one section. So like a, an example of this at Netflix might be that the recommendation engine might not work. So they, they design an architecture such that they embrace that circuit breaker pattern. Um, the gentleman called Paul Nigan, who actually wrote a book called Released It, has a, a whole chapter on that model. And I, and I think I explained the MTTR, MTBF. Um, so there was dev, and then there's ops, and then there's the organization in general. Like, um, uh, you know, allowing slack time. And this is a really important thing, right? So um, Eugene's book, The Demo, uh, the, <laughs> the Phoenix Principle, <laughs> I'm sorry, the Phoenix Project. It's late. It's it's now getting close to 9:30 here. I've given two. I spoke t twice today at interrupt, so I'm starting to get fried. So forgive me, all you uh, forgiving listeners. I hope somebody's laughing at least once or twice here. It's uh, pretty funny to us, John. Just keep going. Funny how? No. <laughs> there you go. We're, uh, so we're thank you. Thank you. Time. Good. Good. Thank you, guys. Um, so yes, it's a thing. All right, cool. So here's the thing, right? So there's this concept of slack time, right? So I don't, some people have probably heard of the Google 20% time. Um, this really goes back to, um, you know, again, Gene wrote in the Phoenix Project this kind of novel. And actually, Gene's book was a rewrite of a book by Elliot Gorat called The Goal. And Elliot Gorat is basically the father of something called the theory of constraints. And, and the theory of constraints is basically understanding the global flow of something and understanding that certain things might be fast that might slow down other things. So there is this kind of, I want to make sure that I don't have bottlenecks that, that hurt me in other places. And companies, and I like go will talk a lot about this efficiency syndrome. And like the efficiency syndrome is a bad thing. Like I want all my people to work. 50 hours a week and like and I need to make sure that when they check in and clock in they are constantly working getting coffee is a bad thing stopping to talk to somebody is horrible right you have to be 100% efficient and you know and the truth of the matter is like physics like denies that like and Elliot Gorak gives a great explanation of why this will not work and Google figured out that they had to give everybody 20% time and so, um, and it's a hard one. It's again another hard pill to swallow for most enterprises to say, "Hey, by the way, I think you guys should take one day a week and focus on kind of other stuff." Oh, are you kidding me? My guy, my people are working sixty hours a week, and now you want me to take twenty percent of their time and let them do things, have the freedom of doing their own stuff? Yes. When you ask me that question, the answer is yes. And by the way, there's a whole theory based on it called theory of constraints in manufacturing. And and um, so uh, so again, um, slack time. Um, you know, allowing people to free up to do. And what happens is, like, I'm sure anybody who's on this call right now, at this time, you know, especially if you're in the U.S., especially if you're on the East Coast, like, you're probably pretty awesome. Like, because why would you, certainly if you stayed this long. <laughs> like, and so you are, in, in, no doubt in my mind that just about everybody on this call is probably somebody who I'd love to hire, right? And, and whoever has you, like, must, like, if they don't know, you're awesome. And, and, and the point is, if I gave you a day off a week, I'm pretty sure that everybody who's, like, tolerated me for the last 50 minutes would not go play golf, would not just go around and take a nap. What you would all do is you would basically fix things that were broken that you've never had time to fix. And what would happen is the organization would become so much more efficient. All right, I'm, I'll calm down. I'll calm down. <laughs> so uh, um, embedded engineers is a really good hack. Um, oh, oh, I've seen a lot of companies, and I've recommended, I've helped companies do this, where, like, yeah, John, how do we even get started here? So why don't you take one of your really trusted ops people and just move them into the dev organization and have them become part of that culture. And, and when the dev people are figuring out how to deploy an application and they want to use slash something, slash something, you can say, oh, you know what? If you did it something, slash something, slash something else, it would make the ops people's life much easier. Right? And you get that, and that's a really cool tool. I mean, along with Slack time, you have kind of hack days. I'm a big fan of hack days. 
again, it allows people to get to this place where they can, like, hey, you know what? Why don't we fix that thing that everybody hates that's been broken? And 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 um, how many people? You know, I, I'm not gonna ask for the hands, so you can kind of we can virtually or theoretically answer this question. How many people heard of Cassandra, right? So uh, Cassandra was actually created at Facebook in a hackathon, and in fact. And it was because of a bug, not a bug, but a, a bugging, nagging thing that some of the Facebook developers hated in the way they were currently creating records in kind of distributed file systems. And, and although it actually never really was heavily used at Facebook, from so from what I'm told, um, people at actually Rackspace and a few other companies picked up on this really cool tool and now actually it's a very popular distributed data store and in fact if you watch any videos on Netflix pretty much everything that you're getting has been coming from some streaming cluster that's running Cassandra. Um, you should actually be running in your organization everybody should be on a really cool kinda hip cat. I use this thing called Slack with some of my team. Chat room, Skype, whatever it takes. Like just be connected. And in the end you know, and this this goes out to the kind of people who haven't embraced this. Like, make your environment fun. You know, you go into. I I've been following Puppet Labs forever, and I, I recently was in Portland, and I got to visit their latest office. And it just you walk in the door, and you realize there's beer taps, there's ping pong tables, there's like, I mean, like, it's really like like before you even get past the receptionist, you're thinking, wow, this place must be fun to work. And they're not the only ones. There's lots of companies that have that. So, in the end, um, you know, or the end, getting near the end, um, I think that what I try to impress on, upon people is there are some things about this thing we call DevOps that's still hard to describe and let anybody understand. And but the hardest part of this is these are counterintuitive things, like classic IT thinking, and and myself, I I've had to be beat over the head to accept some of these principles all along the way. And you know, and there are things that are like, ooh, ooh ah, we, ah, we can never do that. Ah, that would hurt so much. And, and, and what you find is once you get that light bulb or you can convince your management of the light bulb and, and there are great resources out there um, to do this, um, you know, there's this, you know, embracing failure. Failure is a learning opportunity. Fell fast, fell often. Um, Less time in design. You know, the web scale companies get this. They don't spend a year. Eric Reese talked about this in a minimal viable product. Get things out in front of customers. The customers will direct you. Deploy in small increments. If you deploy something that took six minutes to build, chances are you're going to be fighting bugs for two months. It's so much more efficient to actually put small incremental changes in and catch those things early. Um, Eric Reese has a chapter on it. He has a book on it. Jez Humble has a continuous delivery book. There's re tons of literature now written by why this works. Embracing slack time. You know, in Kanban we call them whip limits, work, work in progress limits. When I first heard of this, I thought the guy was explaining to me was out of his mind. I was one of those guys that said, "Hey, I got I got ten people that work for me. They all work sixty hours a week, and you want me to basically tell them they can only work on a maximum of, five, of three things each." In the end, you know, I, I read uh, Jim Benson's personal Kanban, and it's like, oh my God, I so get why that works. And ultimately, it was in you know, Elliot Go or at, and um, you know, in fact, actually, the Kanban for software was invented um, basically because the author escapes me now for a minute, but um, of the Kanban for software was on a plane ride trying to struggle with how to how to manage a large agile development org. And he read Elliot Gorat's The Goal, and he basically, you know, he had this epiphany about, oh my God, that's how I'm going to run my agile department. And you know, and people in process, you know, it's a cliche, but in DevOps, we mean it. We mean it. Uh, some tools, um, value stream mapping. Um, Mike Rotha, a book called Learning to See, S E E, shows you how Toyota and the manufacturing people actually look at the whole stream to understand the flow. Um, again, I, I would encourage you to look for some organizations that have done some write-ups on it. All that, that book is actually all done in a manufacturing paradigm. You can easily figure out how that would work for a software flow. 
something called Canavan. This is, Canavan is kind of out there stuff. Um, one of the authors of the Venus Project, Kevin Baer, has done a lot of presentations on Canavan. It's something that I really want to learn a lot more. It's a, it's a, um, it's kind of a, I'll call it an architecture for understanding how to deal with complex systems. Um, it, it's really interesting. If you really want to go nuts, um, there's some really cool stuff about game theory and how to do, and, and DevOps, you know, Nash equilibrium, that kind of stuff. Um, it, that's where my head starts hurting. But um, so in summary, um, DevOps is, you know, what DevOps tries to introduce is not just a bunch of tools. And any vendor that says, hey, buy my tool and you have DevOps, um, they're lying to you. Um, the tool may work and it may actually somehow make things a little better. But in the end, it, this is a human problem. You know, how humans interact with machines, figuring out how to get that balance. You know, the problem of DevOps wasn't because you didn't have the fastest tool. It was because there was, a, there was this weird friction or cultural friction between those two metaphoric groups. Um, embracing continuous learning, continuous improvement. Um, in, in Japanese lean culture, we call this Kaizen. It's, it's a continuous improvement. In fact, greater forms of this are called uh, Kata. There's a great book called Toyota Kata. It's also, again, I highly recommend it. Eliminating waste. But don't eliminate waste at the cost of flow, customer value. Um, I think, you know, I mean, I, 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 I'm going to just say that there are some interesting companies. Cody, you want me to go on for another five, or what, what do you, what's your take? Oh, yeah. um, so I would go on for another five, but I wanted to actually touch back on your value stream mapping bits or so. Um, for sure. So uh, I wanted to point out Simon Wardley's uh, keynote that he gave at – OSCON this year, where he went through not so much the, the value stream mapping, but uh, like value stream was only part of the equation. You have to then watch the keynote. It, it explains it much better than I could. Um, yeah, Simon. So yeah, Simon I, yeah, no, Simon is an incredibly smart guy and and, and, and has some... In, like, I actually got to work for Simon. I was actually at Canonical when we were, they were first kicking off their cloud project and I had, uh, you know, the incredible opportunity to actually work under him. But he has this thing called the mapping, you know, and he does this really cool stuff. Um, I, I think there's, you know, the nice thing about mapping is understanding this, the big difference between value stream mapping and, 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 and Simon's mapping, and both are really important. Simon's mapping is really good for understanding your strategy of a company at a higher level and how you fit in and how you are strategic. I mean, he really takes almost the military mapping concept to look at what you're doing strategically against what other competitors might be doing. Um, the value stream mapping is about looking at the direct flow. Like how do I, what is, what happens when somebody does this first piece of software? What happens when it goes to here? How does it get to a server? How does the server get built? And you're looking for these pockets of waste. Like, oh my God, I had no idea that every time we built a server, when we got to this step, somebody had to go walk five buildings over to building G to go then talk to a secretary who had to wait a week. To, you know, I mean, those are the things that you uncover with value stream mapping that are, like become mind blowing because nobody even realized that this was. Oh my God, this this is what happens because what you do is you interview everybody. You interview first the senior level, the C level, then you drill down to kind of mid level manager. Then you talk to all the, the kind of, uh, as I say, grunts, and you draw this, like, what we call right-to-left view of how you get things done. And what, it, it's so enlightening to, like, oh, my goodness, we had no idea we were doing this or that. But, yeah, again, hey, sign John. stuff, and, and if you look at – yeah, go ahead. Oh, I got a question for you, John. So I, I think a lot of people on the line are those grunt operations people at core or they come from that background. So say they're sold. You've absolutely pitched DevOps culture as a beautiful thing we all want to adopt. What does an individual have as a first step? Um, and can honestly, can an individual make a change in the organization? Yeah, you know, I, you get this question a lot. And I will tell you, um, there's a couple of answers to this. I mean, they're really, uh, you know, the, you know in, in kind of important order, the first answer is, 
if you don't get senior leadership buy-in, you are really going to struggle. You know, I mean, you know, Etsy. You know, we, you said in the beginning like Etsy is like an awesome poster child, and it is. So like, out of all these three companies, though, my favorite, you know, kind of poster child is Etsy. And the thing about Etsy, the CEO was a software developer, and, and that, that's that's not rare for a software company, but for a company that is an e-commerce, that is kind of rare. And and like right from the top down, the the CEO sets this agenda of culture first, right? And and embraces DevOps. So um, again, if you're in a large organization and you have leadership that is basically stuck in a well, how, I, you know, this could never. Ever. If your leadership says things like, you know, that's interesting what you're doing, but make sure it never, ever, 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 ever breaks the system. You got, you know, you got two choices. One is you can try to scratch and kick your way out of that by giving them things like the Phoenix Project, giving them books by a gentleman called Sidney Decker, um, basically, sh you know, showing them, forcing them to read articles by John Allspar, actually s making sure they send them to the DevOps Enterprise because you're going to get to hear those companies I listed early on, like Disney, Macy's, Barclays, we're all starting to embrace these concepts. But in the end, if they still don't get it, there's a great saying. It's called, um, you know, change your job or change your job. You know, like change your company or change your company. Right? Like, like you know, um, and, and I know I may be flippant for me saying this. might be people on this call. It's like, hey, John, I've been working on the same company 15 years. But I suspect if you're on this call at this point, your skill set is pretty desirable. And, again, I'm not asking anybody to leave. But I'm just saying you have to kind of go through the analysis. If, if I can't change my management, and I can't change this organization, and I know they're fundamentally wrong. And if you don't believe they're wrong, right? Hey, and you know, have a party, right? Like, uh, but if you believe that they're fundamentally wrong, not just because I said it, because you listen to John Osborne, because you read Gene's book, because you read, and at that point, like the decision is, you know, what am I doing here? Um, so, but again, I think the senior leadership is, you know, and and just to follow in on that, it's a great question, by the way. But um, so if you want to take the route of I'm going to be the evangelist here. Then there might be a slow roll. Like you might, I tell people, start a blog. Because I've seen this happen. You, you're the one that starts the blog. You start reblogging. You start writing about things. You write like about the Phoenix Project. You you write about something you saw in a presentation. You read something really cool. And you just, you're you're building these artifacts of information. Now all of a sudden, they make a change. The CIO like leaves, and a new CIO comes in that was at maybe Disney or one of these companies. And their first question is, what are we doing with DevOps in this company? And everybody's like scratching their head like, oh, Susie actually was basically been writing about this for about a year and a half. Right? Oh, let's find out what Susie thinks. Right? Cause, you know, and you know, so I mean, th those are kind of things. I think trying to find other influencers. I, I also tell people, you know, again, this is a lot of the, the hard way to go, but if you're, a, if you're in a kind of more of a management level, and Jesse Robbins, who I work for, he was the CEO of uh, OpsCode. Before that, he ran all commercial properties for Amazon. His title at Amazon was Disaster, Master of Disaster. That was his title there, right? But like he tells these stories of like, you know, what you do is you find somebody who like you think gets it, and you say to him, "Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to if you do this, and it's a success, you get all the credit. I won't take any credit. If it fails, I'll take all the blame." Now you gotta be willing to do that, like, and be like, live up to your uh, your bargain. But again, so there's a lot of hacks. We're gonna have a lot of hacks in the DevOps cookbook. So, um, very good question. You know, just finishing up. I, I think I, I just want to go ahead. Well, I'm just gonna say while you finish up, John, if there are any questions, raise your hand on the go to webinar, and we'll uh, we'll give you talking rights. So one of the things that, and so as soon as you get there, let me know. But um, the uh, one of the things I think a lot of companies do, you know, we, we say culture, 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 or CAMS, culture, culture, culture. And like, it doesn't mean that you need to change your culture. Some companies figure out that there's something really awesome about their culture, which may not be awesome to other people. And then they figure out, hey, you know, they, like Netflix is a great example. I wouldn't like working in Netflix. In fact, if you look at that last bullet item there, Adequate performance gets a generous severance package. They're not kidding around. They say, come here and be great. 
And it's not like, oh, we are, everybody, we are, it's great, right? Well, everybody says that. But this is like, come here and be great. And if you can't be great, like in, in a place where you better be great, then we'll give you a nice bonus, but you're out of here. Um, you know, and, and so that's an interesting culture, and they thrive on that. The people that want to go there, um, I did, uh, Adrian Krakow was the architect of a lot of what went on there. I did a podcast recently with him. If you want to hear his brain about how he talks about how they built this kind of culture, you know, the GitHub culture is interesting. Um, obviously, they're going through some growth problems now. You know, things that were interesting when I wrote this presentation are a little marked. Um, you know, they, again, they've had some issues, but, but there is this culture of people like collaboration. They get the GitHub workflow. They want to go there. Um, but Etsy is my favorite. Um, you know, they got a blog called Code is Craft. So if, if you get to ever see a video by their CEO, Chad Dickinson, and he talks about like that, you know, like, so if you don't know what Etsy is, it's kind of loosely speaking um, an eBay for arts and crafts. And they, they say that, you know, what we like to do is enable people to make a living making things. You know, and, and so they think of themselves as artisans. So now their customers are the people who create stuff, and we think that code is something, is a craft as well. And like there's an alignment between the way they think and the way their customers think. And and um, just to bounce around a little, there's a gentleman called Simon Sinek. Um, he's got a TED video. It's called Start With Why. I really encourage everybody to go out and listen to that. It's like about eight, ten minutes. If you really like it, buy his book. Because in his book, he talks about this magical situation where a company, where the people in a company believe in something, and the clients or customers of that company have the same beliefs. And when you get in that situation, you know, I, there's no other way to describe it from my perspective other than magic. Because you, you have this kind of motivation from the people that work there. They believe a certain way, and this is why we wake up every day and why we come here. And the people actually buy our product. And he actually uses early day Apple examples. That he, he, his argument is, among other companies, Apple has a people that believe in delivering solutions in a certain kind of way, and their customers kind of like those kind of ways of thinking about controlling, you know. Uh, this kind of adjunct technology to you, to the human being. Anyway, so that's it. Um, here's the crazy reading list. Uh, you know, uh, the Phoenix Project, Canada Delivery, Eric Ries. Um, if you want to go old school, Four Steps to Epiphany, um, Elliot Gore, that's the goal. Um, Toyota Ono, if you want to go real deep. Um, I'm a huge fan of Edward Deming. If you want to follow some of my presentations, I do a presentation called Deming to DevOps. In the end, Deming was the guy who basically invented everything that happened in Japan starting in about 1940. I say that Deming was the Shakespeare of quality and management principles in in Japan, ultimately became Toyota Parker System, ultimately became Lean, ultimately became Agile, ultimately became Agile Operations, ultimately became DevOps. So that's uh, that's it. Um, okay. So. Uh... First, there's well, actually, there was a couple of little bits of Q and A. I lost the one in the Twitter feed because it wasn't tagged with the brown bag hashtag, but it was especially relevant. I'll I'll look that one up as you answer this one, which is when you have some pretty heavy duty uh, compliance constraints for things like change management and so forth, and then uh, e evolving that out into you know like some random three letter agency has decided that you know I I cannot do things without some other things. How do you handle DevOps in that kind of uh, in that kind of world, especially as it applies to infrastructure? Yeah. So um, again, what you, you're going to find out, and I think the world will completely embrace this in three, five, ten, I don't know, ten years, is that that um, and, and I know this is a hard pill to swallow when I say this, and people get it. Uh, it's like I tell you, this is counterintuitive nature. What you're going to find is there are certain models of operation that are actually, even though they sound like they would work worse, work better. Um, and so like, and, and again, there are companies now, so I know a large, one of the top five banks on the planet who have implemented most of these ideas in a high frequency trading environment. 
Like it doesn't get any. I mean, maybe maybe those three letter government acronym places. Yes, okay. But like, like this is like you know, downtime is calculated in milliseconds. Like they don't say we had a two hour outage. They basically tell you what that time was in milliseconds, right? Um, like have implemented this. So I mean, these principles do work, um, and in the end, they work better, more efficient. You know, if you look at that survey, you know, the, the things that seem like, oh, my God, if I did that, the world would end. Actually, when you do it, the world is actually better. Uh, and and, mm -hmm. and I, I know that's a, that's a, a global – I will say there are companies – so, like, I'll give you some examples. And I can't answer all these questions, and I won't say it's easy, and I won't say it works every time. But my early days at Opscode, I get these calls from people, and they go, you know, I just wanted to thank you. For because we've been struggling trying to get PCI implemented in our company, and Chef basically enabled us to do it. I'm like, what? Holy mackerel! Tell me what you're talking about. Like, well, now we never have to root into a system, and basically yep. because we can show the auditors that we've abstracted all the changes in a DSL, which is much easier to explain to them now than it was to just kind of show them code or config changes. Yep. And, 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 and I can go story after story after story where I can start convincing you that things that sound like they would never work actually work better. So a lot of, uh, a lot of what you touch on is, you know, outside of the, the culture bit, the, the automation, the, the lean, and all of these other bits that flow into that, the monitoring and so forth, because you are releasing so often, so quickly, and, and, and so forth, it, it forces you to produce better documentation. It forces you to produce uh, a, a better system overall, which is then easier to audit because you have all of this there, right? You're no longer artisanally crafting uh, switch configs, right? Yeah, I mean, your repeatability. Um, your, um, again, I think Eric Reese does a great argument in that web operations of, you know, you start thinking about something that's huge and massive like incredibly hard to figure out where it broke as opposed to something that's really – and you know, another thing that plays into this, right, to, to play buzzword bingo, right, is the concept of microservices, people rethinking how they architect software. Um, there's a, a great book coming out, O'Reilly, by a guy named Sam Newton Thurtworth called Microservices from O'Reilly. I've got a pre-copy of it, like, and it gives the rationale of microservices – you know, uh, decoupling the way you do things. Again, none of this is like, if you're in a fat legacy environment where everybody's like screaming and hollering at each other all day, this is not easy stuff. But, um, but the point is, once you can start moving to these models, you, know, you get into a microservices environment, now all of a sudden like a continuous delivery small batch, right? It's now by definition the way you operate, right? There's this kind of service that is kind of independent of other services. When I deploy that, it doesn't break everything else. And if you're using a circuit breaker pattern, like when it breaks, everything else still works. It just can't use this one thing. So, yeah, no, it was a good question. I mean, Cody, I, I know you, you know. Hey, John. Go ahead, yeah. John, one more from, uh, from the Twitters. The question is, how do you, wait, I just lost it. Cody, where do you put it? Okay. How do you get a rock star to be a team player if you're all in this together? Any, <laughs> any strategies or recommendations? I mean, these can be pretty... Uh, pretty yeah. yeah, you know, I don't, I, I don't have much tolerance for rock stars. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, you know the, the quick answer is fire them. You know, and you're like, oh, my God, you know, Bill, we fired Bill. Everything would stop working. The world as we know it would be horrible, and you know, and and sometimes you know, I like I've seen this move. I've been doing this 35 years, guys. I've seen scenarios where you bite the bullet. And again, I don't want to fire Bill or Bob or Sue, whoever this rock star is. I want Bill and Bob to fight to get it. I want to, I want to like spoon feed them the Phoenix Project. I want to make them, you know, I want to do a Clockwork Orange where I put toothpicks in her eyes and make them watch some videos, right? Because I want Bob to get it. Like, I, you know, he's extremely valuable. Um, but in the end, um, you know, the, the, I'll tell you a great story. So John Ospar, early days, I, I, was, um, I was trying to uh, sell um, Chef to um, 
to the, the Etsy guys, and they had a guy that was actually their rock star chef guy. Actually, was a committer, everything. But culturally, that guy, um, there was a lot of older school sysadmins. They were having a hard time with the transition of these ideas and all that. So, um, you know, I don't know if you guys ever read Jim Collins' Good to Great, right? There's a great story in there where and sometimes you, if there's cancer on the arm, you got to cut the arm off, right? And and John and his team like let this guy go, and I was like, oh my god, this is like the only guy that knows Chef. In fact, he's like he, even today he's one of the best. And there was nothing wrong with him. It was just he was so far ahead of the curve in the way he he thought, and it was and the other part, the other team members were threatened by him. And so these guys made a decision to get rid of like an incredible asset. And I've I've been I'm friends with this guy over the years. He's 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 like. He's a world-class contributor to Chef Project, um, but like that was the thing they had to do to get to where now today they are the poster child. So, um. no, it's a powerful story to think about. Where you know, if you're running a team, it's it's more complex than just you know have people start listening to somebody else. And if you are that individual, I think there's some really good self-reflection to be done. Yeah, and what you hope is those people, I mean, you know, typically they're really, so, I mean, there is this problem of people build these, the, like this kind of, they have this control and, and they become the knots in the system and, and like, you know, and at that point, like, yeah, they may be, the, and, and, you know, if you do some, like you do some value stream mapping, you might find that the directory structures of their scripts are kind of just a little too cryptic. <laughs> You know, and I'm wondering why they're like that. I wonder why nobody else gets to see these or share, right? You know, like, like, wait a minute, is this the way we want to go? <laughs> exactly. Hey, John, we want to be respectful of your time. So uh, I think with that, you've answered a lot of questions and gave us enough reading for the next few years. Um, so we will, <laughs> we will iterate probably one page on each of them per day until we complete them and. Uh, Thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you on the internet if they want to follow up and read more, learn more from you? Yeah, so the best place is um, is really literally Bachagalup, uh, the B O T C H A G A L U P E, Bacha Galup, right? Um, that is, um, and from there, um, I mean, DevOps Cafe, I mean, I, I've, you know, a lot of my, you know, I get to pick the brains of really smart people and, and ask them a lot of questions, and like, you know, you guys do a lot of this. So the, the DevOps Cafe podcast, Botchigaloop, um, I'm Botchigaloop at gmail.com. Um, you know, again, I, I, I've kept that. I change, people know me. I change jobs a lot. So, like, your best bet is the one static way to get a hold of me is called Botchigaloop. And, uh, and, like, and I'm pretty interactive. You know, I think you guys can tell. I, 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 love, I, I, love, I love this whole idea of helping people understand how to do this better because, in general, our industry kind of stinks. The way we treat IT professionals, right? Like I want people in our industry to live a better life. I mean, it sounds hokey, but and, and actually, Gene Kim taught me that. I, he kind of changed my view on, you know, why we do what we do. You know, so so ping me. I would love to talk to you about any of this stuff. Any anybody's out there. Yeah, that's a great note to end on right there, John. So uh, Cody is signing off via me because he's having some audio issues. So thanks everyone for listening in. We'll post this live soon and see you next week as we continue to explore DevOps.